Well, thanks, David. It's, it's always a pleasure to be <clears throat> sorry, back in Santa Barbara and at the KITP in, in particular. Uh, so I want to start by apologizing that the title as advertised, I think, was from string theory to exotic materials and back again. But I realized last night when I was adding the final touches to this talk that I, there wasn't going to be time for coming back again. <laughs> so, so this is going to be a one-way trip, but I hope it's a, an interesting one uh, anyway. <coughs> and so the main, the main uh, message, the main theme of this talk is sort of going to be the uh, unity of physics to some extent. And um, the main point I want to get across is how things that seem very different can sometimes uh, not be so different when you look at them the right way. And, and this is manifested these days. So string theory has been many things over time. But now it feels to me like a melting pot of ideas that is drawing from uh, all over physics and hopefully sometimes giving back to the rest of physics too. So for example, if you walk into a, a sort of randomly chosen string theory conference this year, you might find talks on quantum gravity and particle physics or uh, geometry or black holes, which are the more conventional um, things that string theory has been applied to. But you also find talks on cosmology, on nuclear physics, which is the quark gluon plasma, and on things related to condensed matter physics, which is partly where this, this talk is going to be going. And for those, I, I know there's some string theorists hiding in the back there. The size of these circles is not, and their location is not related to their, <laughs> to, to, to the importance of these uh, relative endeavors. Uh, but there's the idea there's a mosaic of concepts from traditionally very different branches of physics that uh, come together in what we could call contemporary string theory. So before I go to strings, I thought I should start with particles, which was what there was before there were strings. Um, and, well, and the main thing, we should start with something that is, is just true and well established before we go on a somewhat speculative uh, direction. So what is established is that in high energy physics uh, is that there are, there's a whole zoo of particles of which I have some listed here. So there's things called leptons, the tau lepton, the muon lepton, the electron, a good well-known one. Then also these quarks, and the quarks will build up the, uh, the protons and the neutrons. And we call these elementary particles. Now, it's not so much important whether at any given moment in time the particles we happen to know are really the elementary ones. They may be made out of something else, that's, but that will still be a particle. So there's this concept that the basic building block is a particle. We may, have, may or may not have found the basic particles, but the, this essential constituent, the way of thinking, is, is framed on these notions of particles. And how do we know what these particles are? Well, basically because physicists have spent something like a century staring at pictures like these ones, where they slam some particles together, stuff flies out all over the place, and you, you sort of take a photo of it. And, and so these tracks are really uh, you know, are particles. And, and by carefully disentangling their very complicated motions, we work backwards to deduce what the, uh, the basic ingredients uh, are. Like you know, smashing together two, uh, two cakes to see, to see what they're made out of, what the ingredients are. OK, so string theory is going to go beyond that. And so let me try to do just a one slide summary of, of string theory. And so the idea is we're going to take these, this notion of a particle, which you know, is really very well established. And you can, you can see them, right? There are these, you can take pictures of, of some of the particles, at least. And then each particle, we're going to replace it with, with a little, literally a little, little loop of string. The name string theory is not, it's not metaphorical. It, you know, it's, it's, it's what they are, the little loops of string. Now, I'm not going to explain why somebody wanted to do that. 30 or 40 years ago. Okay, we're going to find that this has many interesting consequences. But the sort of immediate consequence that it has is that once you have a string, something that a string can do that a particle cannot do is it can oscillate and, and vibrate in different ways. You know, out of one guitar string, you can make many different notes. There are many harmonics. So the, the, the single string has, has many harmonics. Of course, this goes on uh, all, the way, all the way down. So, so it's, in that sense, it's, it's an enlargement of the structure of physics. So every particle is going to get replaced with a whole, a whole bunch of other particles. Now, to make the string vibrate takes you some energy. Okay? So these strings, these, excited, these, these are called the excited string states. That would be called, be called the ground state of the string. These excited states are very heavy. And, and so that's why we, we don't see them, we, we would say. Whilst these lowest string states, this would be the electric 
something like the electrons. So the light part, the particles that we've seen, which are the, are the light particles, would be these ground states of the string, but they're also all these excited states that you know sort of seem to be going along for the ride. And and part of this talk will be about making these all this new stuff that you threw in, th threw into the theory make it do some do some work for you. Okay, but this is the idea of string theory. Instead of particles, they're going to be they're going to be little loops of string. All right, so this talk is going to pivot around three around the triangle, and and so the notion is going to be that this this extra structure, this this extra stuff, the fact that you allowed these things to have a internal degrees of freedom to, to, to vibrate, will allow us will actually act as a bridge between two things, which I, I will explain what they are, um, which had previously seemed to be very different. So one thing that we're going to talk about are, are black holes. And another thing we're going to talk about are, are gauge theories. And it's these gauge theories that are going to be related to the exotic material. Okay. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce black holes, gauge theory, and then we're going to go like that and hop from one to the other. Okay. That's going to be the logic of this talk. Um, right. So here it is. It's a bridge between, okay, and I say black holes involve gravity in a very essential way, and these gauge theories definitely uh, do not involve gravity. Okay, so let's start with, I'm going to start with black holes. Um, so, here are two facts, well, a fact and a, a story that, that, that may also be true. This is meant to be Newton sitting under his apple tree a few, several hundred years ago. And, and of course, people knew for a long time that things fell under gravity, of course. Uh, what, what, what Newton's insight was was that this attraction was universal, and that it was the same attraction that made things fall, that so also made the planets uh, was it the sun, go around the sun, and the moon go around the Earth, and so on. Okay, so we have this notion that everything everything is attracted under gravity, and there's just no way around that. Whether you're the moon or an apple, uh, you're gonna you're gonna fall under gravity. Okay, so that's the universal attraction of gravity. Ingredient one, and ingredient two is this, you know, famous or infamous fact that you can't go faster than the speed of light, okay, which is uh, around 300 million mile, uh, meters per second. Okay. So now let's take these two facts together, and I'm going to just briefly argue for you that these imply the existence of very strange objects, which are called uh, black holes. So. As you may know, so we're on the Earth, right? And suppose we want to get very far away from the Earth. So we build ourselves a spaceship and, you know, fly off. And a, but to be able to leave the Earth, we need a certain minimal speed. There's an escape velocity, which is the, we need to go up, up, upwards at a certain speed if we want to get out of the gravitational pull of the Earth. But, okay, I don't know what that is, actually. Perhaps somebody does. <laughs> but if the Earth were much heavier, that escape speed would be much bigger. You need to go much faster to get away from the Earth because it would be pulling us back much more strongly. And so there comes a point where the Earth would be so heavy or so dense that the speed that you need to go at to escape would be faster than this speed limit, the speed of light. And then we wouldn't be able to leave the Earth, and in fact we'd be living inside a black hole because even light can't go faster than light, and so nothing escapes on these black holes, not even lights. Now, black holes exist. Um, they're in the center of galaxies. So the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, has a, has a black hole in the middle. And I think that's pretty well established by this point. So they're very exotic things, but they, uh, they, they do exist out there. And they're really a, a more or less a simple consequence of two basic facts of physics, one that Newton told us and one that Einstein told us. Okay, so here's where interesting things start happening. So black holes exist, but the black holes I'm going to tell you about in this talk are more a sort of theorist's tool, okay, a way of thinking about physics and about gravity in particular. So it turns out that black holes really capture the essence of gravity in some, in some distilled sense. So from what I told you, you can fall into a black hole, but you can't get out again. Okay, this is the, the popular image that, that probably everybody has by now of, of, a, of a black hole. And so it makes sense that if things fall in but they never come out, the black holes over time can only get bigger, not smaller, because you know, then something falls in, it grows a little bit. Okay, it's plausible. And in fact, 
uh, Stephen Hawking proved that in the 1970s, that the area, the, si the, the, sort of the area surrounding a black hole, which is called the, the event horizon, okay, so the event horizon of a black hole is that boundary beyond which you can't escape. Once you go past, you can't get, you can't get out again. And that always, whenever something falls in, it gets bigger, but it never gets smaller again. Now that's quite a strange thing, because that means that black hole growth is irreversible. It's something you can't do something about. It always gets bigger and never gets smaller. And irreversibility is a, is a very particular thing in physics. And in fact, you're all familiar with irreversible things. So if you mix your milk and your coffee and you stir it together, you know, good luck to you trying to separate them out again. Okay? And, and so mixing things uh, is also effectively an irreversible, an, an irreversible process. So it seems that in some ways this idea that black holes always get bigger, which is something intrinsic to what they are, uh, is somehow similar to milk and coffee getting uh, stirred up in, in a cup. And so the way the, the, the word we use to describe this fact is something called entropy, and the idea that entropy increases. And so, okay, entropy is a, a slightly slippery uh, concept, so, so let's see uh, if we can uh, describe what it is. So the idea is that what, so both the milk and the coffee are, are made out of molecules of, let's say, milk and coffee, just to, to simplify things. And if we took two of the molecules of milk and swapped their positions, it would still look the same. So there are many ways that all the molecules that milk is made out of could be rearranged without, and you wouldn't, looking at it from, from on your cup, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And the entropy is the measure of how many ways you can re, uh, orga, uh, swap something around and so that it looks the same. And this is related to order, to how ordered something is. So if I've got a box with gas all over it, if I, if I move one of these over here, it doesn't make any difference. And this is very disordered. But if I had a box with all the gas in one corner and I took a molecule of gas and stuck it here, then, then you'd notice, okay? And that's like having, so we would say that this is a more ordered state and this state has more entropy. So for example, now if the milk was all on one side of your glass, sorry, can everybody see this? Yeah. And the coffee was all on the other side, if I take a little drop of milk and I put it here, that's something that's immediately visible. But if I scramble it all up, then you don't know where the milk and the coffee is, and then all, all the possible rearrangements you could do won't make any difference. So it's the idea that the mixed state is more entropic, is more disordered than, um, than the ordered state. Okay. And so the second law of thermodynamics is the statement that things always get more disordered over time. Okay. And, that, and that's this irreversibility, okay? So, you know, some things you can, um, there are plenty of processes that are reversible, but this increase in disorder is, is not reversible. So these black holes that keep growing reminded people in the 1970s, they, they sounded familiar uh, to these kind of processes. And so, in, in some, some theoretical uh, acrobatics, uh, Beckenstein and Hawking in the 70s, in fact, proved what I've been trying to tell you you might have suspected or physicists suspected was that these black holes, the reason that they always increase, their size has to get bigger, is because secretly their size, their, their area, is a measure of how entropic they are. Okay, so, and so these black holes, this is the only formula I'm going to show. This, I think, this formula should be the E equals MC squared of the 21st century. Okay, so the, you know, E equals MC squared is this, this um, what's the word I want? Uh, well, famous doesn't, there's a better word, but anyway, it's this emblematic formula that if anyone knows one formula in physics, they know this one. So this formula should be equally important for, for the physics, yeah, contemporary theoretical physics. And so what's it saying? It says that the entropy of a black hole is, this is Boltzmann's constant, not important, it just sets the numbers, it's just a number, times a quarter of the area of the black hole, so its size, okay. measured in Planck units. Okay. Now, a Planck unit is the smallest distance that exists. Okay. So below, below a Planck distance, 
the very notion of distance probably doesn't make sense. So now, these black holes are big things. For example, the black hole in the middle of the galaxy is you know, a few miles across. I don't know how many. Uh, someone here probably does know. And so this is a really, really huge, huge, huge number. Because it's the size of something you know, ev on everyday units uh, measured in the smallest possible unit you can, measure, you can imagine. So this, this, this entropy of so what, what the conclusion you get from this is that the entropy of these black holes is, is huge. Okay. Um, so remember, just let me take a step back. We think the idea was that black holes should have an entropy associated with them because they display an irreversible behavior. And things that are irreversible in physics is normally a sign of, of this disorder, of this entropy growing. <coughs> so these guys actually went and computed the entropy of a black hole, and they got this answer. And then there's a one quarter. Okay. So black holes have, are very entropic objects. So that's what I'm saying here. So for example, a solar mass black hole has 10 to the 18. That's a very big number, more entropy than the sun, which is also a solar mass object, of course. Um, now, there's another funny thing here, which is that the entropy of these black holes are not proportional to their volume, but to their area. Okay. So normally, if a black hole, if entropy is a measure of how messed up something is, you might expect that if you double the amount of stuff you have, the entropy would also double. So for like if I have, if I have a, a, box, a, a cup of coffee, if I take two cups of coffee, the entropy will be double. Okay. But these black holes, it's not like that. The entropy is proportional to the area that of, of, of the black hole, not to the volume. And that was a very, very mysterious thing that we theorists are still struggling with uh, 30 years later. Okay, and we're going to come back to both of these things. The point I want to make, the first point, is that this entropy is so large that it, it's very difficult, maybe impossible, to account for it using conventional matter. And by conventional matter, I mean those particles I showed you at the beginning, the quarks, the leptons, uh, the photons, and so on. And so why, why, how could that be? So what this means is that, so in the coffee, we just had molecules of milk and molecules of coffee, okay, and they were mixed up. But if we had three, if we have coffee, milk, and sugar, then we can get an even bigger entropy because we have more things that we're mixing up and there are more ways to mix them up. So the idea here is that even if you take all the types of particles that we know, there's just not enough ways to mix them up to make this entropy so big. Okay. Now, I've set this up so hopefully you're all thinking that string theory has all these extra things, right? So maybe all these extra ingredients that we threw into string theory are somehow just what we need to make the black hole tangled up enough inside. All right. And so that's the first connection that we're going to, I'm now going to tell you about, which is, very briefly, this connection. So we, I, that was black holes, very, very briefly. And now I just want to quickly tie this back uh, to, to, to the string theory. And, and roughly, the picture, let's say, and we're going to have black holes from the outside later, so we'll have black holes from the inside um, at, at the moment. And, and so basically this is the picture, that the, inside the black hole we have all these, excited string, all these excited string states, and together there are enough of them, and they're complicated enough, that they, that they can make up the entropy of the black hole. And in particular, in certain mathematically idealized circumstances, so not for the black hole in the center of the galaxy, but uh, a theorist a simplification, idealization of a black hole, People, uh, firstly Strominger and Waffer, actually exactly counted how the entropy, the number of ways you could put all these states together, and they got out exactly this formula that, that um, Beckenstein and Hawking had come up with uh, about 20 or 30 years before. For my purposes, another version of, of, of this picture um, that, that actually holds more generally, which uh, I think goes back to Suskin, but I learned about it in a very nice paper by Horowitz and Polchinski, which I should mention. Yeah, Horowitz that's Horowitz that's in the back of the audience there. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Polchinski, who's uh, also a permanent member of the, the KITP. And, and, and what they did, oh, Joe's there too. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, so, so they did the, the, it's the following argument. Start with a string. And then imagine just pumping energy into the string so that it starts, it starts becoming more and more excited. But you do this in such a way that it doesn't get too big and it stays small. And then at a certain point, so the string 
by itself will have will have an entropy because these these more excited states. Okay, so there's only one ground state, but as as maybe th these more excited states, there there are lots of them. So there's sort of lots of ways. The more bendy the string is, the more ways there are of it being bendy. So you know you could sort of take out this leg and make that leg twice as long or something. Okay, and that would have the same the same energy. So there are many different ways of creating these uh, excited states. And then, so you, you keep exciting the string, and it gets heavier and heavier. And then there's a certain point where the string becomes heavy enough that it exactly fits inside its own event horizon. So it, it creates a little black hole where, that it just fits inside. And at that point, what uh, these people check is that the number of string states that you have is more or less the same as the entropy of the black hole that's exactly the same size. So strings can sort of continuously be converted into a black hole. And that, that shows you, I think that's the, the best sense in which this picture means something, that you can, you can start with a string, you give it more and more energy, and, and it sort of gradually becomes a black hole, where the entropy of the black hole is the number of ways you can excite these strings. Okay. And nobody expected this. So this sort of thing happened in you know, mid-late 90s. And these strings were invented in the you know, mid-70s for a totally different reason. And, and so it turned out that these extra ingredients that people had put into the theory were just what you need to make gravity a self-consistent theory. So gravity somehow, the fact that gravity has black holes, and these black holes have this huge entropy, requires there to be more all these extra degrees of freedom in the theory, which are these excited string states. So the excited string states sort of f fall into place in, inside these black holes. Okay, so that was, so remember strings, lots of, ex, lots of excited states, black holes, things that grow and therefore have an entropy, and the entropy is that they're made out of strings, more or less, okay? Okay, so gauge theory. Uh, you know, I remember when I was just starting my undergrad in physics and you know, I was looking through the courses in the second year and the third year, and there were these courses called gauge theory, and I always found it a very intimidating uh, words when I didn't know what it was, but it, it's really something pretty simple. So um, let, let me introduce it to you. So what a gauge theory basically is is a is a generalization of electromagnetism. So electromagnetism is the theory of well magnets and electricity. Um, and but okay, so this is the this is the key picture that that explains what what electromagnetism is. So in this case, it's a magnet. So hopefully this is the iron filings. Hopefully most people. All of you know what this is. So you take a magnet, you have some, some iron filings, you put them on a piece of paper, and then the iron filings will organize themselves in this way around the magnet. And so the magnet has a north pole and a south pole, and these iron filings go, go, from, go from one to the other, and you get this picture. So what, what this is sort of showing you that's characteristic of electromagnetism is that you have, um, well, in this case, poles, but you could also have charges. You could have a positively charged particle and a negatively charged particle, and then there are these sort of lines of force that, that connect them, okay, or field lines. So these things are called, these li what, what the filings are allowing you to visualize here is that there are these things that are theoretical abstraction, but they, they exist, which are these field lines that are sort of connecting, in this case, the poles of magnets. So, right. Now, another, ver another place where gauge theories appear is in uh, quantum chromodynamics, which is the theory of protons, neutrons, and quarks. And here the picture looks like this. So you have these th three quarks. So what's uh, what is this meant to be? This is a proton. <laughs> Good. So a proton is made out of three quarks. And they're sort of bound together by things called gluons. But what these gluons really are are sort of lines of, of flux, as we say, lines of field strength. Which are the, So these lines that bind together the quarks to make, to make the, the proton are really the same sort of thing as these. And that's the gauge. So what gauge means is that there are these kind of <laughs> field lines that, that, that want to bind things together. Okay. Um, can I say something? All right. So the main difference, but well, there's an important difference between these two pictures, is that here the lines are quite floppy. They kind of, they sort of ex extend out into all the space. Whilst in, in this picture, in the quantum chromodynamics, the lines are very thin and concentrated. And that's related to the fact that the force holding the, 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 these, this up quark and this down quark are really bound together very strong. If you try to separate out, uh, the, try to pull them apart, 
um, these right these these flux tubes don't want to stretch because they're, they're very thin and they have a big very strong tension and they don't want to pull them apart. Whilst this magnet, there'll be a certain strength, but you know any of us can hold two magnets and if they're not too strong, of course, and and pull them apart. And the fact that you can it's possible to pull apart these magnets is is related to the fact that these field lines are not all concentrated in, into a little a little tube connecting these guys. All right, so um, now here comes the connection with exotic states of matter is that it's believed, by, by some people at least, that this kind of physics so of, of particles that are sort of attracted to each other through these lines of force also describes certain exotic uh, states of matter, possibly including high temperature superconductors. Okay, so let me try to explain, and this, this, I think this is the hardest slide that I have, um, um, but let, let me try to explain why these gauge theories or these, these lines of flux might appear in, in <coughs> materials where you don't, didn't start with them. So the physics of a metal is, is based on, on electrons, okay? So the reason that copper conducts electricity is because you apply your electric field and all the electrons in the copper sort of happily move along and they, they carry the current from one side to the other. And so it's the electrons in a metal that are doing all, all your work. Now, electrons have charge. That's why when you apply an electric field, they move, right? They have a charge and they're repelled or attracted by the electric field that you apply. But they also have something called spin. And, you know, I think it's not too incorrect to, to, to view this as the electron is a little ball with an arrow through it. So the electron is pointing in some direction, and that's the spin of the electron. It's like, well, it's spinning around, around this axis. Now, so an electron comes with a charge and a spin, but it turns out that sometimes, and I'm going to try to show you why, you can think of this spin and this charge, which are, are normally bound together into one object, as going their own way. All right. So, so how, how does this happen? So suppose, let's do this, this one is a bit easier. So suppose we have a bunch of electrons in a line. So this might be a metal. So a metal is a crystal. It, it has some, you know, it's, there's certain atoms in, in certain places. And then the electrons sort of hop between atoms, okay? And that's how they, they conduct. So imagine these are a, a row of atoms in a crystal sitting, sitting at different points. And suppose that we've done something to them. You can apply a magnetic field, say, and that will line up all the spins. All the spins will want to point in the same direction. Except this one, which, for some, which you know, wants to be different, so it's going to point down. So this one has to spin down. Now, suppose that these two swap places, okay? So now the down spin is in the second position. And now suppose that one swaps the place with that one, and then that's here. And so what's happening here is that the electrons are staying in the same place as far as the charge is concerned. So the charge is not moving. Okay, the charge, there's the same charge at each point at any given time. But the spin is moving by itself, right? Because now this one was the down spin, but now the down spin here, and that could keep on happening by swapping the one that has the spin going the other direction can, can, can move along by itself. Okay? So what this effectively <coughs> is looking like is that the spin can move by itself without dragging the charge with it, because there's another electron next door that can, that can carry the spin. Here's the other picture, where suppose that for some reason there's an electron missing. So this, this circle is meant to denote the absence of an electron, which is called a hole in um, imaginatively enough, in, in condensed matter physics. And, and so, so we've got a hole here. And now, again, just suppose these guys swap places, and the hole can be there and then there. And so, again, what can happen is the absence of an electron can move. But the absence of an electron doesn't have any spin, because it's just it's the absence of anything. And, and um, so, again, it's like the absence of charge can also move around by itself. And so, if we want to describe this, this system theoretically, it can be useful to imagine that the electron is split up into something called spinons, which is a spin that moves around by itself, and holons, which is a little hole, an absence of an electron that moves around by itself. I, you know, these are the words that people use. So, however, that's sort of a theoretical fiction because at the end of the day, we know that there are real electrons and that the spin and the charge of these electrons are, are bound to come together, come as units. Okay, so if we have 20 electrons in the system, they're going to be 20 spins and 20 charges, and that's not something we can change. 
even if their excitations or the way they move around separates them up. And it turns out, it, I really, this I'm afraid I, I wasn't able to distill into a picture, that the way that you keep track of this fact, that the spin and the charge are together, is that you imagine that there's some flux lines that connect them, and that every spin and every charge is like a positive and a negative charge in a different sense. So, so okay, let, let's, let's um, so like, it's like the charges are the north poles and the spins are the south poles, and then there's a magnetic flux line that's connecting them. Okay, because we have to somehow keep track of the fact that there's, at the end of the day, the thing is made out of electrons which have spin and charge. So in, it turns out that in these systems, of, of, which are just made out of electrons, okay, there's nothing fancy. The fact that the spin and the charge can sort of move separately in this way uh, forces you to describe them in terms of these gauge theories, which have these lines of flux. So these spins and holes uh, are connected by flux. I'm afraid I can't do better than that. Um, but it, it's true. So these, <laughs> the, the, these, these electronic systems have descriptions that mathematically end up looking very similar to, to these kind of pictures or, or these kind of pictures where you imagine new entities, which is the spin and the, ch and the charge of an electron separated. So this up quark would be the, the charge and the down quark would be the spin. But because they're really the same object, you have this sort of glue that keeps them together. Okay. All right, so that was a very brief. So gauge theory just means charged particles with lines of flux between them. So now, this, now I want to, so remember we, we did this one. So now I want to go down like this and connect strings and um, gauge theories. And so this, this, this is, I think this is a very nice theoretical move that we're about to do. And um, it's really analogous to this, this idea of a Gestalt switch. So a Gestalt, I think, is German for uh, form or shape. And, you know, you all know this picture that you look at it and you don't know whether you can look at it. In two, basically, this picture admits two interpretations. It's either there's a black background with a vase in front or there's a white background with two faces in front. And it's your choice which one you see as the background and which one is the foreground. Okay. So we're going to do exactly the same thing. Um, so, yeah, I guess what I didn't, um, maybe should have emphasized one thing. Sorry. That these, these flux tubes, so here it says glue on. Okay, and that's because these flux tubes are also made out of particles. They're, they're little, little lumps of gluons, one behind the other, that make up this flux tube, while these are photons. The, 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 the so-called quanta of the electromagnetic field are, are little, also little particles. Everything's particles. Okay, that, that was the, in the picture that I was describing. Everything's made out of particles, even these, these, force, these, these flux lines. So it's like one photon behind the other one connecting the two ends. Okay, but sometimes that's not the way you want to think about it. And so that's this picture, that you have your positive charge, your negative charge, or your north pole and your south pole, and this flux line that connected them is made out of these little particles that might be photons or gluons. That would be some, some examples. Now, this guest out switch that we want to do is that instead of thinking as these particles is the real thing that dynamically come together to form a flux tube, we're going to think of this flux tube uh, as, as, the, as the basic object instead of something that's derived from the quanta as the thing that we want to start with. Um, and you, you can go backwards, but it's, it's a bit more complicated. So, so um, well, it's not, okay. And so, and these flux tubes, of course, look sort of like a string, okay? They're an extended, extended object. And so if you try to write down a theory that doesn't describe this quanta that's making up the flux tube, but instead describes the flux tube as an object in and of itself, you end up with basically string theory, something very similar to string theory. And in fact, this is how string theory was discovered, that the people wanted to try to do this, to treat these flux tubes as the basic objects rather than the particles that were making them up. OK, so that was very brief. OK, so the idea that these gauge theories, which are made out of particles like gluons or photons, are what, uh, sometimes it's, it's better. Okay, when is it better? Like, okay, maybe I should, I should. That's this first line. So, individual particles are all fine if they don't act, interact too strongly with each other. Okay, so it's just like, you know, this one knows about the existence of this one and that one maybe, but not that one over there. Okay, so they're, they're sort of weakly, in, they're what we would say weakly interacting, 
and, and it makes sense to think of them out of these building blocks. But sometimes when you have what are called strong interactions, that all the particles are talking to all the other particles, it's very hard sometimes to make sense of what even a single particle means because it's, it's tied very strongly together with everything else. And it's in those, in some sense, these quanta. So the quanta mean, that's what quantum mechanics gets its name from, okay? It is the mechanics of quanta. And the quanta are these little particles that, that make things up. Uh, they, they sort of, they don't retain an individual existence anymore because they're, they're all talking, you have to consider that all of them at once. And, and that's when it, it makes most sense to think of this string as the, as the basic object. Okay, so, so strings are extended things. There are lots of them. They make up black holes. But by virtue of being extended, they're also, a good, they're also like these flux tubes in, in gauge theories, okay, these, these lines that connect, connect particles. So now that we've done that, now let's see. That might make us think that we could go from here to there directly. And in fact, there are more people who thought about this in the 70s. So what's, what's quite remarkable about this, this sort of mosaic of different concepts that I, I showed you at the beginning is that they came from many individual different strands of, of thought that, that people have been developing independently since, since the 70s, and then they all come together and everything makes sense, which makes theorists very happy. So now let me try to say why black holes might be directly related to gauge theories. So I told you about black holes from the inside. From the inside, black holes are these very entropic, very complicated things like coffee exponentiated, okay? Extremely messy, uh, messy, messy, messy thing. Um, but from the outside, black holes are very, very simple. They just, things fall into them and they get bigger. And that, that's pretty much all, all, that they, all that they do. But we could look a bit more carefully about how they get bigger. So something you could do if you're brave is you go with your spaceship and you hover right outside a black hole and you drop a pebble into the black hole and, and see what happens, okay? Yeah, a pebble, let's see. And so what you see is that's what this picture is somewhat symbolically meant to rep oh, Sorry, there was one more equation. So this is the surface of the black hole. Here's, I dropped the pebble in. And then what I'm gonna see is sort of some ripples. In, yeah, I, I basically I'll see it dissipate into the black hole in, in much the same way uh, let me see what's a good analogy if I dropped a pebble into some honey or something. Okay, it would, it would, it would ripple a little bit, but then very quickly just dampen off and, and, and smoothen out and disappear. Uh, so, so it relaxes, this is the statement, that when we excite the black hole, that means drop in the pebble, it relaxes back to equilibrium like a dissipative fluid, which means that there's, for a short amount of time, there's some ripples and then it smooths out again. The black hole gets a little bit bigger, and, and, but it's again smooth, okay? And, and that's what, what, what uh, a state of matter does. So you throw something like honey or, or water or coffee. And in fact, what's interesting is that the, the time scale, what an interesting quantity is, how quickly does it relax back into its smooth equilibrium uh, shape? And it does so on a certain time scale that's characteristic of something called a quantum critical medium. Now, I have a problem here because, okay, so this formula, this is the time scale. This is how much time it takes this process to happen. So H bar, that's Planck's constant, and KB uh, is Boltzmann's constant. So these are two fundamental constants of nature. If I was talking to an audience of physicists, I would set them both equal to one, okay? We don't care. They're just, num they're, they're special numbers. They, 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 they don't have, it's not something you can change, so we don't really care what their value is. We should, right, okay, good. But then there's this temperature. Now, I haven't really told you but because I don't have time, but it turns out that as well as an entropy, a black hole also has a temperature, okay, um, which is in fact closely related to its entropy. But so this temperature is a property of the black hole. Um, okay, you just take my word for that. And and <laughs> and the the time scale at, at which things at which these things relax are, is given by only by the temperature and by nothing else. And that's what's meant by quantum critical. So a quantum critical medium is, um, how should I explain it, is one that doesn't, that doesn't have any intrinsic scales. That, so a scale is like a, a, a certain size, you know, like the KTP has a, has a, sky, a size, right? The KTP is not, uh, is not scale invariant, um, but something that would be scale invariant might be, might be these, these pictures by, by Escher 
that, that I won't I won't, I won't try to, to reproduce, but you know there are these circles, and then there's some pictures of bats or something, and and these and these bats get smaller as you go in. I hope I hope that's a, <laughs> at least a reference to something that, that some of you know what, know what it is, um, and so that is scale invariant because when you look at it on different scales, it looks it looks the same. Okay, so unlike the KTP, where if you look at it from space or you look at it from this auditorium, it looks very different. Okay, so it has a has a fixed size. Uh, so these quantum critical materials, medium, media, have the property that if you hit them hard or you hit them very gently, that they behave the same way. Okay, they they they, they don't have a characteristic scale or size associated. Or you look at them as a small size or a big size. Everything, of course, has to be smaller than the, the actual material that you're looking at. But, but that over some range of scales, it looks the same. So it's, it's the same with the black hole. That it's the only scale it knows about is the temperature, um, which is not. Uh, how can I explain this? What is the temperature? Just the, the the size of the black hole, basically. Yeah, but that you see, that's going to get confusing. Okay, let, let me. I, I, I want. I want. Maybe we can come back to this, but I want to explain this now. But what I want to say is that. So if I have a material that's quantum critical, that's scale invariant, and I hit it, the time the time at which it relaxes will depend on how hot it is, which is its temperature, but it won't depend on any other property of the material. That that's because it has this scale invariant property. Okay, that wasn't great, but um, <laughs> okay, these. Black holes relax in a very distinctive way. Okay, that's similar to certain exotic materials. Okay, that's just I'll, I'll leave it like that. Um, which is something we, we want. Okay, because I'm I'm trying to aim at these these gauge theories are, are off these gauge theories that when when this happens when when in these circumstances where exotic materials are described by 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 these lines of flux by these gauge fields, they often have the additional property of, of scale invariance. Okay, and so the fact that a black hole relaxes in a in a very particular way suggests that they may be related to these scale invariant exotic materials. Okay. However, at this point, you get confused. So you might want to say that I really want to think of this black hole. As an exotic material, okay, it behaves when I probe it, when I hit it, the way it reacts is similar to these to these scale invariant materials. But a very confusing thing is that their entropy, this basic property, <coughs> is going like their area, not like their volume. And in any material, exotic or not, that you could ever build on Earth, its entropy will go like its volume, not like its area, okay, because that's how much stuff it's made out of scales extensively. You double the size, you double the amount of stuff it's made out of. So how can we reconcile these facts? And this is where um, Maldacena made a very innovative use of another infamous aspect of string theory, which I haven't told you about, which it has these extra dimensions. Okay, So maybe if people have heard one thing about string theory is that it has all these extra, it doesn't predict that we live in four dimensions, but in 10 or 11. So what, 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 here's a case where an extra dimension or two actually helps you to, to deal with this, this problem that the entropy was going like the area instead of the volume. And this is the picture. So, and it's called a holographic correspondence by analogy with a hologram. So a hologram is really, it's an analogy. It's not, it is not a hologram. But in a hologram, you have a three-dimensional image stored on a two-dimensional plate. Okay? And this is, this is going to be the idea that here this will be our gauge theory, so this is our exotic material lives here. This could be in, in the world that we live in. And then this black hole is going to live in a bigger space, in a space with one extra dimension. Okay. Um, right. Now, this is quite hard to justify, but it, at least it's one way of getting around the fact that the entropy of black holes scale like their area. So if I should think of the black hole not as a not as a exotic material in the space it's living in, but as an exotic material living one in one dimension lower than area, right? Because 
Um, uh, I want to say this right. So here I've got a my circle, and so the, the and then so this black hole has an area and a volume, but an area here is like a volume in one lower dimension, right? So so the area of the black hole is is a surface. But in, in one in, in two dimensions, the surface is the area, right? That that's what I'm, what I'm trying to say. It, it's also this picture that this this black hole might have a volume, okay? It might be a box, but its area here is like is the volume of this gauge theory because this gauge theory is in one lower dimension, okay? So by right by saying that your theory of gravity lives in one is exists in one higher dimension than the theory than the real our real world, which is if we think of as here. It, it gives another way of thinking about this black hole entropy, okay? That the black hole entropy is the entropy of an exotic material in one lower dimension. Okay. All right. So now, okay, so that, that completes the, the pivoting around this diagram. And so what, what I've just tried to give you an impressionistic sense of is that string theory, black holes, and gauge theories uh, can all be related to each other, and in some sense, are really all the same the same thing when you look at it in the right way. And so, for the last five, maybe ten minutes, I want to give you a flavor of some of the things that are happening now at the KITP um, in this program that, that David talked about, where we, we'd like to actually use these correspondences to to learn something about these exotic materials. So, I've argued that exotic materials have some things in common with black holes. Is Let's, let's, let's see what we can, what does that, what does that buy us? As, as <coughs> okay, so firstly, let me introduce the exotic materials that we'd like to understand. So these are real, you know, I'm a theorist, so I'm always in awe of, this is actual data from an experimentalist that spent many years measuring, you know, different materials. And, um, okay, so I'll, I'll, let me, I'll explain these plots in a second. But the punchline, okay, so the, I want to introduce the, the exotic materials that we'd like to understand. And I'll tell you what this sentence means in a minute. But the bottom line is that the normal state of unconventional superconductors is, in fact, not normal. Okay. So where did this name normal come from? So some materials, in fact, many metals, when you cool them down at a very low temperature, they become superconducting, which means that they conduct electricity without any resistance, which is obviously a great technological thing. The problem is that it costs too much energy to cool them down, that it cancels out the benefits you might get by... You know, the fact that they can transport heat, electricity, without, without losing energy. So what we'd really like is a superconductor that was superconducting at room temperature, let's say, or at least not, not too cold, but that doesn't exist. So the low temperature state is called the supercondu superconducting state, and the state of matter above the temperature where it's superconducting is called the normal state. Okay, so, you know... Uh, this blackboard is in its normal state. If I cool it down enough, it might become superconducting or not. I'm not sure. Now, these normal states, uh, exactly, their word indicates that they're not meant to be very exotic things. They're meant to be the sort of stuff we're surrounded with. However, in these exotic materials, which include things called cuprates, nictides, heavy ferments, organics. So cuprates are made out of copper and oxygen layers. The nictides are made out of iron and things like arsenic sometimes. So these are, you know, specific families of materials that chemists can, can make. Um, and the cuprates are particularly interesting because they're the ones, of all the materials that we know, they have the highest temperature at which they become superconducting, which is, let's say, around 100 Kelvin, which is still, you know, minus 200 degrees centigrade or something. They're still, still pretty cold. But, okay, they're the hottest ones we know, and so we'd really like to understand how they work, because if we understand how they work, we might be able to you know, make better ones that become superconducting at even higher temperatures. And the fact of the matter is that after 30 years, it's been 30 years since these things were discovered, and we still don't know uh, how they work. Okay, it's not understood why, um, why these high temperature superconductors are high temp relatively high temperature superconductors. And one reason for that is that their normal state, so the state out of which the superconductivity emerges when you cool it down, doesn't behave like normal matter. Okay? It has some very strange properties. And that's what I mean by saying that the normal state is, in fact, not normal. Okay? The, the, the non-superconducting state is not normal. 
And that's what these pictures show you, as I'll <coughs> very briefly explain. So this is temperature. This axis is temperature. These are three different, very different materials. This axis is not too important what it is. It's something you can do to the system, like applying a pressure. You squeeze it, okay, for example, literally in this, in this case. Okay. Now, what we see here, these things at the bottom are called superconducting domes. So this is the region where it's superconducting. So if you're sitting here, let's say, and it's cold enough, if, when it's hot, this is temperature in Kelvin, okay? So this is still, you know, minus 100 and something degrees here, 170, I guess, or something. So this is all very cold. But when you're up here, when it's hot, it's not superconducting. And then when you cool it down enough, it is superconducting. And depending how much pressure you apply, it becomes superconducting at a high, at a, you know, <laughs> to Kelvin, a relatively high temperature or at a really very low temperature. Okay, that's what these diagrams are. Now, the interesting thing about these diagrams are the colors. And now what's been plotted in these diagrams is the resistivity. So a basic property of a metal is its, is its resistance, right? So you apply an electric field, and some of the energy that you put into it, you get out again the other side by electrons, current that's being transported, and some of the energy you lose into heat. And the energy that you lose into heat is the resistance of the material. Okay, it's how much, because it's not a highway. They hit, they have, they bang in. The electrons bang into things as they're trying to carry the current, and that and that energy you lose. Okay, that's the resistance. And so, right. And so when it's superconducting, the resistance is zero, no resistance. Now, what these lines are is how the resistance changes with temperature. So you have you have your metal. Suppose I heat it up by 10 degrees. Does, the resi does it become more resistant or less resistant? Okay. And so it turns out that normal metals, normal or normal metals, are supposed to have a very particular dependent of the resistivity on the temperature. The resistivity is supposed to go like the temperature squared. Okay. It's just a true thing. And that's, so that's what this number is. This 2, that 2, and that 2 is that the resistivity is, that the resistivity is scaling like the temperature squared. Whilst these bits in the middle a red, so that's one, one, and one, the resistivity is scaling like the temperature, not like the temperature squared, okay? I'm not going to explain why that's a very difficult thing to explain, but what I'm trying to show you is that over here, where there's no superconductivity, where not much is happening, the normal state is normal. But just where it's interesting, which is right above where you can get the highest temperature, where you get the highest superconducting temperatures, just above that, the normal state has this funny behavior. Okay, so it seems that getting a high temperature superconductor may be tied to the fact that the materials out of which they develop have, have abnormal properties. Okay, that's all these. I'm just trying to show you that with these plots that the strange behavior of the metal, strange behavior, <coughs> is correlated with a high, a high temperature superconductor. So we'd like a theory of these. Let's call them abnormal states of matter, and also, we'd like to understand where the superconductivity comes from. And that, that's, I think, a, a central problem in condensed matter physics for the last uh, 30 years. So indeed, these weeks, at these uh, three months, even at the KITP, um, have, so there's one of the three programs that's running is about exploring the extent to which this connection between gauge theories and black holes may be useful for understanding these kind of materials and many other things. So I want to give you, I think I want to have time for one example of how this holographic correspondence actually works in practice. And so what might you want to calculate? So I've said that the, the resistance of these materials is something that behaves in a funny way. So if I tell you that these exotic materials might have a dual description as black holes, okay, an equivalent, an equivalence to black holes, then I'd like to calculate then you should ask me, well, what, what does the resistance do? What does it look like? Does it look like those plots or, or not? Well, the bottom line is we don't know yet, but I just want to explain to you how we would set up the calculation at least. So this is our gauge theory. This is our exotic material. And then we basically you know, stick two leads in the battery. We have a battery, and we stick it in at two points. And so we'd like a current to run from here to there. Okay? So these, these are the two points to which we connect our battery a theoretical battery, of course. And so we'd like to imagine a current that's going to run from there to there. 
and we'd like to understand what the resistivity, what the resistance is of this, of this gauge theory. And so the way you do that, so this duality, this holographic duality, gives us a very different way of thinking about this problem. And this is, okay, let me try to explain it. So we append this extra dimensional space onto our real world. This extra dimensional space has a black hole in it, because remember it was the properties of the black hole that were somehow similar to the properties of this gauge theory quantum critical medium thing. And so what happens is that this current that we try to drive, we call this the boundary, and we call this the bulk. This current that we're trying to drive on the boundary creates some ripples in the bulk. And so it, it sort of, right, it creates some ripples. <coughs> and some of these ripples fall into the black hole. Okay, so, um, right. And when they fall into the black hole, they make the black hole get a bit bigger. Okay, because that's, as I told you, that's all the black holes do. They just get bigger. And what that means is that the black hole entropy has grown. But entropy growing is the same as the loss of heat. Okay, so the, the extent to which the black hole grows is the amount of energy that you lose uh, when you're trying to drive your current, you're trying to make a current flow. Like I said, the, the electrons are going to hit some things and you lose some of the energy. Okay, so the black hole description of the energy that you lose when you're trying to make your current flow, which is the resistance, which the resistance measures, is how many of these ripples fall into the black hole. So, okay, one more time. So you set up a specific, I want to calculate the resistivity, okay? And the way I, so the way I do that is that I calculate the ripples in the bulk that this current creates, and I calculate what fraction of those ripples fall into the black hole, and what fraction sort of come back. Some, Right, you like throw something at the black hole, some of it will fall in, but some of it will come, might sort of orbit around the, well, yeah, let's say orbit around the black hole and come back to you. And, that, and that's what that picture, so some of the stuff will come back to you, and that's the current that you'll get, and some of it falls into the black hole, and that's the heat that you lose. So the growth of the black hole, the increase of entropy of the black hole, directly gives you the resistance of this uh, quantum critical gauge theory that you'd like to study. All right, I don't think I want to keep you too much longer, so I'm going to skip this next example, which was about how superconductivity arises in uh, these setups, and I'll just go to the summary and tell you one more time what I, what I told you. Uh, so so th these are the punch, these are the take home points. So string theory, what it does, the, the, the simplest thing it does is that it turns particles into strings, okay? For every particle, you have a string, and that these strings have many excited states, then they can be many different things. And there are enough of these strings, they have enough entropy, there's enough ways of exciting a string that you can make up the entropy of black holes, which from other points of view seems very mysterious because it's so big. But these strings can also play the role of flux tubes in gauge theories, these sort of iron filings. You can think of them as, a, as an object all by itself as a string. And sort of putting all these ideas together, you land this idea of holographic duality, which is that black holes can describe dissipative processes in gauge theories in one lower dimension and in particular, something like the electrical resistivity is, translates into how much, how quickly the black hole gets bigger when you throw things at it. Is, these gauge theories may be relevant for understanding exotic materials. You know, this is definitely a may. No, nobody knows it for sure, but it, it's possible. And so the question that many of us are thinking about for the last two or three years or so, uh, can black holes offer a conceptual and computational insight into these, high, these unconventional superconductors, which despite 30 years, uh, we still don't understand. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> so we'll have um, questions and then, as always, uh, refreshments in the common room. Sorry. I, I know you said you didn't have time for and back again, but could you say something about the and back again? Oof. Um, In other words, how the exotic materials will help us with string theory? That's, that's the idea, yeah. Okay. Or at least... Um, I knew I should have thought about this a bit more. Okay, so... so 
So, so the, the idea is just something like the following, that a very, okay, so a sort of fundamental problem, so gravity is a theory of, of space and time. It, it actually, um, right, so, so there's something I didn't talk about, but, but gravity can be thought of as a bending of space and time, and in some way, space and time itself is made out of, of gravity. And one problem that we'd like to understand is where does gravity come from? Why, why, why do space and time even exist? So, okay. And I don't mean that philosophically. I mean that as a sort of a physical question. How do you, how would you start with a description that didn't have space in it, and then space emerged somehow? Okay. So this, there's a very widespread belief in, in, among theoretical physicists, at least, that space, time is a bit more confusing, but that space. Is not a fundamental concept in physics, but is actually something that emerges um, right out of something maybe more fundamental. And and what this this uh, duality gives us, this gauge gravity duality, so it says that two things are equivalent. That this this theory in the bulk, which has one extra dimension, is equivalent to this gauge theory, which has one lower dimension and no gravity. And so if we could understand how that equivalence really works then we'd understand how to grow an extra dimension of space, okay? Because these two things are, are differ by this extra dimension. And so if we understood how that process really worked, we might understand where space comes from. So, and, right, and so the back, and, and back again is if you understand these gauge theories well enough, you should be able to understand how space emerges, how you get one extra dimension uh, for, for free. Uh, that, that's the idea. It, it comes from understanding these gauge theories, which may also explain superconductors. Yeah. Uh, most physicists think that superconductivity requires some sort of attraction between charge carriers. Right. You don't seem to ever allude to a way to get an attraction between charge carriers, whether they're holes or electrons or whatever they are. Um, okay, that's great. So, let me see. Um, okay, there, there's several, a couple of, yes, I didn't, I didn't talk about that. So, let me tell you one answer within just gauge theory is that this, this, this glue, the, these, these gauge fields that you end up introducing to separate the, the spin and the charge, can also actually end up giving an attractive forces between electrons themselves and, and, and pair them together. So, so in, in fact, I think I'm saying something true, in not, in not such a dissimilar way to, um, uh, to how, how this picture works in QCD. And so these, these what we call these emergent gauge fields, these, these, emerge, these flux lines, uh, do give you, may give you some kind of natural pairing mechanism. Okay, very good. So what's the usual pairing mechanism? So the way a normal superconductor works is, as you said, it, it moves through this crystal of, of ions, of, of, of nuclei, and the way it interacts with these ions is such that it, that it ends up attracting the electrons to each other. Okay, that, I don't think I can explain that in real time, but it's true. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's pretty widely accepted that in these materials, that is not the mechanism that, that causes the electrons to pair. And so you need another mechanism, and one way of thinking about it is that it might be these emergent gauge fields that actually that pair that pair your electrons together. Um, now, in this picture, that's right. So, which I didn't explain, um, the pairing is less manifest. That's right, and and that's um, so yes. So, so the problem with this of pairing as a concept is that it, it it's depends on this, this notion I, that I mentioned before of weak interactions, that I have one electron sitting there and one electron sitting there, and then they can just pair together. But if all the electrons in the, in the metal are interacting with each other very strongly, the notion of a pair becomes much harder, much less useful, actually. And so probably these kind of scenarios describe a different way of thinking about superconductivity that doesn't, doesn't depend on pairing so much.
were saying in the superconductor, uh, if you're running tests with the superconductor, that the heat, oh, is this working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, that the less heat is going into a black hole. Are you generating microscopic black holes, and do microscopic black holes exist? No. Well, um, let me see. So, so this is good. This is maybe an important point to stress that these these black holes are sort of auxiliary mathematical objects. It's not that I'm not sure this is what you said, but it's not that in the actual material there are little black holes that are eating up that are eating up the heat. It's it, yeah. It's a but that would have been fun too. I, <laughs> I, I agree. Well, uh, yes, probably in, in the middle of space somewhere. You, uh, um, I'm not sure. Uh, you have your coffee cup uh, illustration with here I am oh, with the entropy, but of course with the molecules. But of course the molecules themselves have a string theory, uh, string. Uh, representation, presumably. So why can't we consider no, the so, entropy okay. as a... Right. So the conventional molecules or, or the conventional particles and atoms are, are are just this lowest, I would just be the lowest ground state of the string. They're not all the excited ones. So, for example, in this, in pictures, these are not all the elementary particles, but, you know, it's half of them. They, they fit on one page. They're, they're, I don't know, 20. I mean, they're, they're, there's some relatively small number of particles, but there are sort of infinitely many excited string states. So that there's really a, a much bigger structure. Even, you're right, even if you, I think what you said is that these particles are made out of strings, but on, only some of them. Not, not, they, not, not, they don't use this big, this big structure. Uh, so other than the, uh, the damping on the event horizon and the superconductivity, would there be any other properties that you would expect the black holes to share with exotic materials if uh, the theory um, holds? Uh, yeah, I mean, everything. I mean, so, so, so the... <coughs> good, good, okay. So, so that... Okay, so let me let me to give you a sophisticated answer to that question. So so it's useful to have a notion in physics of what's called an effective theory. And let me let me explain what, what that is. So your exotic material at the end of the day is some crystal. Okay, and some it's so it's some we call that a lattice. It's like a square yeah, it's like a, uh, a cubic lattice, right? So it's like um like, like a sort of construction site, right? That is this the the Nice one, joy. So crystal for atoms look something like, like this, right? This right and so on. The, the, that, that's what this you know, wood and so on is made out of. Okay. Now the black hole is not related to 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 this. This is the which we'd say this is the short distance description of, of the the crystal. Now, where these gauge theories become become relevant is when we can well, actually this might not help that much. When we consider processes that happen on distance scales that are that are bigger, so processes like motion of energy and so on that happen on distance scales that are quite a bit bigger than the atomic scale. So the atomic scale is the so the Armstrong angst, Angstroms uh, are the um, sort of this distance between between the atoms? So thing, what I'm trying to say, things that happen at that short distances will not have anything to do with black holes. So, but what black holes should be able to explain are these what we call right. So an effective an effective description of a material is something that doesn't describe the very short distances, but it describes longer wavelengths. Let me give you an example. Maybe that's helpful. So water is made out of molecules of H2O. Okay, we all know that. But on, if you want to describe waves in water, you don't need to know what every, H2, what every molecule of H2O is doing. 
there's a theory of, of hydrodynamics that will describe how the water behaves. So hydrodynamics is an effective description of the water molecules. Okay? It describes processes that happen on distant scales that are big compared to the molecules. So there's something similar here. The, short, the, the equivalent of the molecules are these atoms in a crystal. And the equivalent of hydrodynamics is this gauge theory. And so anything that has to do with this gauge theory should also be describable in terms of black holes. Yeah, the idea is it should be everything. Um, I'm struggling to think of something else that people want to calculate, but um, um, I mean, there's heat conductance. I mean, any, any experiment you can do on a material that doesn't involve looking at the atomic structure should, should be described by, by this black hole. One of your equations uh, showed the relaxation time for black holes uh, going like one over the temperature. What is the typical temperature range for black holes and the range of these uh, relaxation times? Okay, so I'm a theorist, and I, I you know, h bar, all these quantities are equal to one, so, uh, so it's order one in some in some in some units. Um, well, what is meant by the temperature? Is it literally? Yeah, it's literally, so that's right. So for an, good, so, and I'm not an astrophysicist either. So, so I, the temperature of the black hole in the center of the galaxy, I'm afraid I actually don't know what it is, but maybe somebody else. John, do you know? <laughs> Sorry? It's very cold. It's a very cold. So very cold. Very, very cold. This, this temperature is very cold. That's right. Yes. Even though it came from Okay, I know I know one scale, I know one number. Okay, we can do you can do the following. This this relaxation scale, as I was trying to explain, is closely related to the resistivity, which is so how quickly these things fall into the black hole. So I know the following. If you go to the center of the galaxy, you take your battery and you you dangle one end into a black hole there and one end into a black hole there, you will measure a resistance of about three hundred ohms. Okay. <laughs> that, uh, any any two, uh, two points on the black hole. Yeah. Okay. If I if I'm okay, that's a that's a number. I mean, okay. Okay. Maybe it's time for uh, for um, cookies and and sorry. The door prizes. And let's thank Sean again for an incredible. Talk. Very ambitious. <laughs> <laughs>